pleasure to introduce our keynote speaker. Barry Yeoman is an award-winning investigative journalist whose work has appeared in internationally read magazines and newspapers. He specializes in long-form narratives, defines humanity and complex social issues. He teaches writing and journalism at Wake Forest and Duke University. Barry has been active, has been an active and important member of the Southern community for decades. He has been a powerful voice for self-advocacy, empowerment, and friendship. Barry is happy to take questions at the end of his talk. Please hold them until then. Please welcome him. And thank you, Barry. Thank you, Chris, for that warm introduction. And thanks to Lee and to Karen and to all the organizers for putting this conference online. And thanks to all of you for listening. Before I begin, I want to echo what so many other people have said over the past two days. I, I miss being in the same room as y'all. I want to be high-fiving and hugging and eating together. The theme of this conference, showing up for each other, is complicated by the fact that we can't physically show up. And because I only want to speak honest words today, I'll tell you that that makes me a little sad. Hanging in my office here are the footprints that Nora and Dhruv gave me during the closing ceremony in Raleigh a few years back. I have them right here. Receiving them was such an act of grace, and I was hoping to, to pay it forward this year. This is a moment where we're all thinking, wait, where's the page in the instruction book where we learn how to support each other through, you know, while we're separated by all these miles and webcams and all these little Zoom boxes, that, that make us look like little bricks in a wall. I think it was on page 61, but there is no page 61. In my book, we're winging it, y'all. We're winging it w w without any of the tools or any of the experience we think we need. So I'm here today with a message that's pretty simple and also maybe a little hard to believe we've got this we do when all this is done we're going to look back on these months as a time when we learn new ways to show up new ways to ask one another what do you need and to provide those things we're gonna remember 2020 as the year we came together stronger and became individually stronger because we were forced to rely on our ingenuity and reach deep into a toolbox that we didn't even know we had. I know, you're thinking, who's this Mr. Smarty Pants? And why is he so sure that we'll be able to show up for each other in the middle of a plague? Well, this is not my first plague. I want to introduce you to two people who were formative in making me who I am. This is Scott on the right. That's me on the left when I was in my 20s and I still had hair. Though, honestly, when I think about Scott, he generally looked more like this. Scott was funny and he loved Pee Wee Herman and dinosaurs and he loved ginkgo trees because they were as old as dinosaurs. He pretty much loved all animals. These pictures are actually from the day that we went to the North Carolina Zoo. Scott was fascinated by the meerkats. Uh, we also saw rhinos that day, but we couldn't see their faces because they were turned away from us. So we viewed them from behind and all afternoon we told stupid jokes about rhino butts. 
On the drive home, we stopped at a highway rest area. Scott went to use the restroom, and when he came back, he looked very serious. He said, Barry, you better check out the bathroom wall because somebody wrote something terrible about you. I went inside, and there, distinctly in Scott's handwriting, it said, Barry Yeoman sucks rhino butts. The other friend is Todd. He's on the far right of this picture next to me. Todd wasn't funny like Scott, but he was radiant. He spoke fluent Spanish and Chinese, and he worked with teenage immigrants who had gotten into trouble. He was graceful on the dance floor and on the hiking trail, and I loved being with him. Everyone did. We lost Scott first, and Todd a year later. Back then, AIDS was an incurable disease with a death rate of 100%. Scott died within a couple of months of his diagnosis. Todd stuck around for longer. As I said, this is not my first plague. Can you imagine being in your 20s and your friends start dying? I sure couldn't. We were having experiences and emotions that we didn't expect to have for decades. But you know what? In the crucible of those plague years, we found that missing page 61. It wasn't here. It was here. What we discovered was that none of us had all the skills. But some of us were really good at holding a friend's hand and saying the right thing. And some were good at talking to doctors or coordinating hospital visits or dealing with parents when they flew into town. Some could cook. Some had extra room at their house. And some were best when they took to the streets and protested against a government that didn't seem to care about the deaths of a group of second-class Americans. Maybe that sounds familiar today. Together, we all pitched in. We improvised as we went along, and more or less, it worked. These are skills that have carried me through every hard time since. They're helping, carrying me, they're helping carry me today. Likewise, you are developing skills, maybe without even realizing it, that will come in handy and make you stronger for the rest of your lives. It was in the middle of that first plague that I discovered the stuttering self-help movement. It was 1992, talk about dinosaurs, and I was 32. My first stuttering conference happened to be international, so there were people from all over the world. Until then, I thought I was in this by myself. I hated my stutter. It was like a beast I did battle with every day. But there, in a hotel in San Francisco, I met so many people who knew how to show up for each other. Some of that showing up happened in workshops and in big gatherings. There, there was a theater workshop led by an actor named Irving Burton. He died just last year at the age of 95. And it was one of the first times that I felt like I could trust my body and not have it fail me like it seemed to every time I talked. There was a speaker named Kari Anderson, and she was the first person I ever heard describe stuttering as a gift. She told us that we stutterers are especially trained to make other people more patient, first with, with us and then with themselves. But what I most remember about that weekend was the night we left the hotel, eight of us, and went to a restaurant in the Mission District. We were two Americans, four Germans, and two Poles. Our server didn't really speak English, and she was so freaked out around us that she made us pay for all our food in advance. We didn't care. We ate pupusas all night and looked each other in the eyes and paid attention, real attention, as we talked about things like 
what it was like being in Berlin when the wall fell and Germany was reunified. And just that conversation, the way everyone at the table was absolutely present with one of the Polish stutterers translating for the other, that was another form of showing up. When I look at the Barry of 1992, the Barry I was before I walked into that hotel, I hardly recognize myself. That's because the friends I met in the stuttering community fundamentally transformed me. Just like my friends during the peak of the AIDS crisis, each new stuttering friend brought their own strength, leading a workshop or sharing their wisdom or dancing with me when, remember, I still hated my own body. That first conference made me bolder in so many ways. Here's one way it made me bolder. The following year, 1993, I finally worked up the courage to travel to Eastern Europe where my great grandparents had immigrated from. When I got to Krakow, Poland, guess who met me there even before there was such such a thing as email or cell phones or the internet. Members of the Polish stuttering community. They had heard about me from the two Poles I had dinner with in San Francisco. They cooked me a meal, they showed me the city, and they even found me a place to stay. That was 27 years ago. I still have the coffee mug that one of the women from the Polish stuttering group gave me. That was a gift from the Polish stuttering community. You'll notice I say stuttering community and not stuttering organization. Of course, we all love friends and we're so grateful for the vision that, and the leadership and the hard work of people like Lee and Karen and Nora and Stavros and Sarah and everyone else in leadership. But when we say organization, it sometimes sounds a little distant, right? It sounds like them, people who are doing things for us. When we say community, it sounds to me like us, doing it for ourselves and for each other. That 1992 convention, it was held by an organization that no longer really exists. But the people I met in those early conventions, they remain some of my best friends. And along with other people who stutter I've met since, some of whom are here right now. I'm stronger, I'm a more resilient and happier guy. I have a successful career as a journalist, writing for national magazines. I even do work in radio, radio and podcasts. And I have a very different attitude than I did when I, I thought I was going at it alone. As a freelance journalist, I write for a lot of different publications. Last year, I got an assignment from a magazine called The Baffler to write about stuttering. I interviewed some of my heroes in our community, and they said some things that I really believe to my core. First, stuttering is strength. It makes us more emotionally present because we can't hide our feelings. And it invites us to, to be more, and invites others to be more present as well, more honest. Chris Constantino, who introduced me, said it best. So let me quote him here. He told me, it's as if we're temporarily stripped of our clothing. We're temporarily naked. And we don't have control over when we're forced to be vulnerable. However, the more time you spend defenseless with others, the more chances you have to connect deeply with somebody because they've seen you and they've seen all of you. And all they need to do is reciprocate. All they need to do is to strip down too. And by stuttering, we give them that opportunity. Thank you for that, Chris. Second, and this is something Gracie suggested yesterday. Stuttering slows the world down and the world has just become too fast. My friend Josh St. Pierre says that for most of human history, we relied on natural cycles, the seasons, the phases of the moon, 
the modern world has sped everything up so much that we can hardly keep pace. We can't stop and enjoy life. Stuttering forces us to slow down and it forces everyone else too. And that's our gift to them. Third, stuttering makes our world bigger because we want to be fully seen, not reduced to stereotypes. We have the ability to see others too. They might be different from us because of race or generation or sexuality or politics or gender identity, or maybe they have another disability besides stuttering. But still, we can see the wonder and the pain and the worth of all the people around us. At a moment when America is reckon, reckoning with a 400 year history of brutal racism, the ability to empathize and listen deeply to people different from ourselves has never been more important. Finally, and honestly, this one was the hardest for me to believe, but I do now. Stuttering is beautiful. I know that's hard to hear when you're in the middle of a killer block. But think of how stuttering gives texture to our words, makes them sound different from the boring way everyone else speaks. My friend Emma Alpern talks about that little loss of control that resolves itself so beautifully sometimes. She says, I, I love this. I am falling through the air for an instant, then catching the ground again like Fred Astaire pretending to trip when he dances. These may seem like crazy ideas, but I invite you to sit with them for a while. Let me repeat them. Stuttering forces us to show our feelings and that makes us stronger and invites more closeness into our lives. Stuttering slows down a world that desperately needs to slow down. Stuttering makes our worlds bigger and stuttering can even be beautiful. As you build your own community, like you're doing right now, you'll come, come up with your own ways of thinking about stuttering. I can't wait to hear what you come up with. This pandemic, it won't last forever. Pretty soon, you'll be back with the people you love, coming to another friend's convention, high-fiving and hugging one another. I promise. And then in 20, 30, 40 years, young people, people who are the same age as you are now, will ask you, what was it like? You'll have stories to tell about surviving a plague and about showing up for each other even when you couldn't be physically present. You'll have wisdom to pass on to the next generation, just like I'm trying to do with you right now. Thank you. Thank you, Barry. All right, everybody, feel free to ask questions in the chat box. And um, Barry has graciously set aside a, a, a lot of time for conversation. So don't be bashful about asking questions. Please don't. Thank you for these messages. And I'm, I'm happy to answer questions about um, the old self-help movement or about writing and journalism. I think I saw a question just 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 ju 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 passed by. Oh no, no, it, it, what was that? There was a question about um, if you could talk a little bit more about the the um, 
the about the about the the early self help movement? Sure, I'm happy to. Um, so 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 I missed the early early self help movement, which was in the 70s. Uh, I came in in 1992, and uh, w when I said that it, that organization doesn't really exist, it's because at the time it was called the National Stuttering Project, and it's changed a lot over the years. Um, but some of the early founders, they really drew uh, from their connections with the civil rights movement and the disability rights movement and the, um, the deaf community and the feminist movement and the gay rights movement. You know, so much was happening in our country in the 70s, 80s, 90s uh, with groups of people that had always been on the margins asking to be heard. And some of them, some of those groups really did an amazing job at organizing more, more than, more than the early stuttering community did. You know, I, I think, I think, I think Chris will, will remember the details of this more than me, but, but the bus access protests in Denver, where people um, like ringed the buses with, 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 with their wheelchairs and wouldn't let the buses pass out of the garage in protest of the lack of disability access. And the way that the deaf community um, built institutions, it built a university, it built performing arts organizations. And at the same time, you know, there was the gay rights movement and the women's rights movement. And, 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 and a lot of the early stuttering movement drew inspiration from that. Um, you, could, you, you could really feel that in the early meetings. There was a sense of, we've, we've never been listened to, we've never been given power, and now it's our turn. And, um, it showed up in big ways, like there was some political organizing. I remember when A Fish Called Wanda came out, the, the movie with Michael Palin that had a negative depiction of people who stuttered. Um, there, 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 there were protests and Michael Palin apologized. And then there were things like everybody in a chapter all volunteering to answer the phones at a public radio fund drive so that no matter who you called that night, it was someone who stuttered. Um, that is something that, that I feel there's renewed energy for. Uh, you know, there's been more conversation just in the last two or three years about, um, about activism in, in the community and taking a more um, proactive stand and really organizing and making our needs felt. Uh, and, and I'm excited that I feel like we're maybe coming full circle in the best of ways. Barry, there was a question that asked, is there anything you would have wanted to be handled different when you were a younger person who stuttered, especially from your family? Sure. Um, I should say that my parents and my relatives and that my teachers were all operating on information from the time, right? And back then, and, and this, this goes to some of the things that, for example, Roisin said yesterday in the opening ceremony, there was, there was this medical model that was the only thing we knew that if you stuttered, it was a, you were broken, not just your speech was broken, you were broken, and it had to be fixed. And, and I wish there were more people in my life when I was a kid who said, child, you, 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 could, 
got 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 some got some good things to say you got some stupid things to say too and maybe you should reconsider those but 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 you also got some smart things and um there was there was no one who was talking about honoring the voice of someone who stuttered of a kid who stuttered and so you know no one knew how to do that um friends does that so well and and so all of the messages that you, the parents here, have been hearing about celebrating the voice, um, about not just celebrating what your child is saying, but also, hey, you sound really good. You know, you know, you're, 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 has some syncopation going on. You know, you got some, got some music going there. Uh, I, I think that I think that if I had anyone in my life who said said, "Man, your stuttering is giving you some gifts," it would have made all the difference in my life. I've got a question from 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 Heidi. Um, she wanted to know she wanted to know what inspired you to become a journalist. I like to think that I popped out of the womb as a journalist. Uh, I, I always loved newspapers. I um, I wrote a little handwritten news newspaper for the neighborhood when I was eleven. We called it Ifs Ands and Buts. I was editor of my high school paper. Um, and that said, I almost didn't become a journalist because a lot of people in my life said, you can't be a journalist, You're, you stutter. And so I entered college as a psych major and that lasted for three days. I, I went to an orientation from the journalism department and I said, man, the, 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 these are my people. This isn't literally in your question, Heidi, but I, but I want to I want to I want to say it anyway, which is that I think the stuttering makes me a better journalist. It makes me shut up and listen. It makes me want to hear the stories of people who are different from me. It makes me less intimidating, and so people feel more comfortable around me. And so. Um, the privilege of being able to pull up a front row seat at people's lives and have them share their stories with me. It doesn't get much better than that as a way to earn a living. I, I get to, when we're not in the middle of a plague, I get to travel around the world. I get to meet people. I met, I'm, you know, Native American communities in Louisiana or bird watchers in Turkey or people who are saving the lives of moon bears in China. Uh, it's an incredible gift that this career has given me. Barry, how has your interaction with people as a journalist been affected by your stuttering? You know, very often when I send someone an e email and I say I'm a journalist, and especially it's somebody who hasn't worked with other journalists before, hasn't been interviewed, they get really nervous. It's really scary telling your story to someone who you don't know. Uh, and often I'm asking people to tell stories that make themselves really vulnerable. And then I show up and I'm five foot six. No, I'm not. I'm five foot five and three quarters. And my shirts are always wrinkled. And I open my mouth and I stutter. All that intimidation that they've been feeling, all that fear, it just goes out the window. It's like, oh, he's just a dude and he's got a stutter. It's like, he's not scary. I have watched so many journalists puff out their chests and swagger around and 
try to intimidate people or at least try to look cool. And that's, I mean, even if I wanted to look cool, I couldn't fake it. I'm just, I'm just a dude with a stutter. Um, and so I do think it, I, I, I do think it changes the relationship and, and, you know, Chris, you've talked about how when you're vulnerable, you invite other people to be vulnerable. Well, I'm vulnerable every time I do an interview because I'm stuttering. Um, and that invites other people to open up more. There's a question. I heard that you use the term stutter, identity first language to describe yourself rather than person who stutters person first language, which health professionals typically use. Do you prefer to use identity first language or person first language? That's a great question. I switched from, um, from person first to identity first over the last few years. And I think this is really an individual choice. But for me, um, I would always use person first language with something that is unequivocally bad. Uh, so a person with cancer, right? Nobody wants to have cancer patient be their, their first way of being identified. But, um, but I'm proud of my stutter. I'm proud of what it's made me. And so I'm really good with, with identity first language. I'm also a gay man and I don't say a man who has a relationship with another man. You know, I use identity first language um, a lot. I'm also a Jew. Um, I, I'm not a person of Jewish ancestry. So how it sounds for me at this moment, identity first language sounds, oh, I'm sorry, person first language sometimes sounds a little defensive. Like, oh, that's not really who I am. But stuttering is really who I am. Hence the, hence the use of that language. Barry, when did you first go into radio? It was 2005, so I was 45 years old. So I had, I had never imagined I would do this. It wasn't in the plans. And um, I feel like I'm looking off to the side. I, I'm, I'm trying to figure out how to fix that. Um, and right after Hurricane Katrina, actually it was 2006. After Hurricane Katrina, I was doing an article for AARP magazine, so it's a magazine for older people, about older people and Hurricane Katrina. And back then, the magazine had a lot of money, and so they flew me up there to DC, I live in North Carolina, just to talk with the editor about my story. And while I was up there, the head of AARP's radio division said, she popped her head in the door and she said, while you're down there, could you just recall, re record some audio. I don't know what we're going to do with it, but just record some audio. And she had someone give me a little lesson in getting radio quality audio. And so I got back with 60 hours of audio and she paired me up with a producer. I still didn't realize at this point that I was going to be doing radio. And this radio producer basically interviewed me for an hour. And then she came back and she said, here's the script, you're narrating. And I said, Rachel, you do know I have a stutter, right? And she just said, oh yeah, yeah, no big deal, don't worry. And I spent the next few weeks with like 24 seven butterflies. Um, my narrate, it was an hour long segment. My narration was probably 15 minutes. Um, it took us four hours. Uh, apparently, if I were fluent, it would have taken three hours. So, yeah, radio is hard for everybody. But, 
you get over that first hurdle and it doesn't get as ever feel as scary again. Mary, was there ever a time when you when you felt that it was important to disclose your stut your stutter before um, before in, in 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 interview? That's a great question too. And I'm thinking, I disclose a lot before when I'm teaching. I, I teach journalism and and writing, and I I always disclose because we're in it for the long haul. Um, I generally um, will try to read the room. And if somebody has a first reaction of, what's that? Then I'll disclose. Um, and if that's not their first reaction, sometimes I'll just find a way of dropping my stutter into the conversation, a more casual disclosing. But, you know, more and more people are familiar with stuttering. We can thank, uh, you know, the King's speech and Joe Biden, um, you, know, you know, for, for, for that. Um, um, we could, in other words, we could thank John Hendrickson for that. Uh, so it's not as unfamiliar. And I can't tell you how many times within the first 20 minutes, somebody says, oh, my boyfriend's cousin stutters, or oh, I used to stutter, or my, my mom stutters. So um, it's like one of the tools in the toolbox I have, and I use it when I need to. Barry, when did you first use or say to yourself, it's okay to stutter? It was after that first conference in 1992. Um, I had never felt it was okay to stutter. Um, when I was in my late, so I, I went to speech therapy until I was in my late twenties, and I recently reread the the clinician notes from from it, and basically said, "Man, he's a hostile he's a hostile dude." Uh, I get every Monday I would drive fifteen miles through rush hour traffic. I'd be stressed out, and I would get there, and I would have to report that I had not made any progress but I'd be perfectly fluent in the therapy room. And the clinician who was almost always 20 years old said, what's the problem? You know, you clearly know how to not stutter. And so it, it felt like a battle all through that time. Um, my first real public disclosing came when I was 29. I, I was working for a newspaper and somebody, um, who was writing a column for the paper, it fell through. And suddenly there was a space to fill. And my editor said, do you want to write a column about your stutter? It's due in 48 hours. And that was my big kind of coming out as a stutter. I got so much good feedback. But even then, I didn't really believe it was OK to stutter. It was only when I heard other people, when other people showed up for me and said, man, you're all right, you're, you're, you are all right, we're all right. Being in a room with all those hundreds of people, uh, all of them stuttering so beautifully, but also being accomplished and nice and good looking and athletic and um, realizing, oh, these people, they all look like the cool kids in my high school and they all stutter. That was a real, that was a real breakthrough for me. Um, so you said that when you teach that you, uh, you disclose because you're in it for the long haul. Um, do you think that disclosing allows more depth to your relationships? I totally do. I totally think that when you signal early on that you are 
um, you're going to be vulnerable. Again, it lets other people open up. Um, and I remember um, pretty early in my teaching, I, I had a student come to me and say, uh, I have social anxiety and um, I feel okay talking about it because you talked about your stutter on the first day of class. And I, I, I know other teachers have had similar experiences. Um, some of you know, know, oh, 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 Asari, who's at SUNY Stony Brook. And I interviewed Abina for the, the Baffler story and she teaches there. And she said that people come to her with all sorts of personal stuff because they know that they can trust her because she's, she's trusted them. Barry, what are your hopes for a teen who stutters in the year 2030? Um, I hope that, uh, so, so, so that's an ambiguous question. Uh, a, a, a person who's a teenager now or, or a teenager in 2030? I'm going to answer it for, 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 the, for, the, for the kid who is a teenager in 2030. I'm hoping that he comes to a friend's convention and um, and I, 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 I'm just I'm just looking at all your faces. I, I don't even know who to choose, but you know, but 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 Jaden or Christina or or um, God, any of you, um, uh, yeah, you, <laughs> um, that 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 one of you that 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 Gracie is standing up there and saying, I'm, 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 I'm here for you and here's my experience. And that, that, that there's this, this ballooning thing that happens where if there was nobody for me and there's a lot of people for y'all that there are a ton of people in 2030 and it's not just people who stutter. That, um, that just like, you see, um, you know, more and more people showing up for their gay friends, and now finally, maybe more important people showing up for 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 their, their African American friends and their immigrant friends. That 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 teenager in twenty thirty is going to have lots of people, not just people who stutter, but allies too, showing up for them. I want stuttering in 2030 to feel as normal as being gay is finally feeling now. Barry, we have some questions about sharing those five lessons um, that you talked about. And also, um, if people want to get a hold of you to talk with you, is there any way for them to do that? Sure. Um, first, I am easily Googleable. My website is barryyeoman.com. It has my email address on it. Um, I, I can I can also I can also write it in the chat box. Um, I will do that right now. Uh, um, and I, I, I don't know if the recording is going to be available, but um, but but if it is, then you can watch the the recording. I, I'm also happy to send send the text of those lessons 
to Lee or somebody else at Friends and happy to, to have them share. Um, it, it was four lessons and, th and three of them are, 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 are in the Baffler story. Um, so, if you, so you just have to Google Barry Yeoman Baffler and it will be the first thing that pops up. I'm, I'm thinking we might be out of time. Yes, um, that's the conclusion of our keynote. I wanna thank Barry for such a wonderful talk. Um, judging from the comments, it was uh, in, enjoyed by everybody. Um, thank you for sharing your self with us. I think we all benefited from it, Barry. Thank you so much.